My name is David Beasley. My name is Bob Renning. My name is Doris Ann Lemon. My name is Martha Hemphill. And I am the great, great, great grandson of Richard Beasley, first settler at the head of the lake, later Hamilton. And I'm related to Henry Bostwick, who's a Lieutenant Colonel in the first Oxford militia. He was my four times great grandfather. And I am descended from Mary Titus Williams through my maternal line. And I would be the fifth great granddaughter of Mary. And I'm the third great granddaughter of Titus Gear Simons. So Richard B.C. came up to the head of the lake. Where he actually settled was um, in, uh, he had houses down on the bay uh, off Burlington Heights. And that's where uh, the Governor Simcoe visited him and uh, Lady Simcoe did her wash drawings of the, of the place. Uh, it was, it's uh, an interesting how he had enough money to build this great house to, on the Burlington Heights, on the height itself, overlooking the bay. And he grew uh, vegetables and apples and pears and whatever, cherries and other things like that. He uh, was a fur trader at a very young age, and he was in Parliament as well. He was Speaker of the House, the early House. He, uh, he developed the militia and uh, this area. So when the War of 1812 came, he was the Colonel of the Second York, and he fought in a lot of the battles for the War of 1812. Uh, because the British officers mistrusted the Canadian settlers, um, he had a difficult time with them. But he, he was a loyalist, and he, uh, in his 50s, he was fighting hand to hand. Uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> uh, in the war uh, of 1812, uh, General Vincent, when he was retreating the second time from Niagara, decided to take over his house and make it his headquarters and just threw them out. And, uh, uh, and so he and his family and his domestics had to find somewhere in, in, in the village to live. And they used all his fence posts, whatever he'd built up over the years, they tore them down, used them for firewood. Well, uh, there is again bad blood between the British officer class and uh, the um, Canadian officer class. When he was able to reclaim the land in 1814, uh, it was a real mess. And he, uh, we, we know that because of his claims on the, on the government uh, for restitution. Probably resented it, but after all, it was wartime. Um, and, and so it was quite crowded. All these refugees coming from there, and then later on, refugees coming from Niagara. After the war was over, around 1815, a lot of people made claims on the government for the, the ruins that their property had been brought to. Now, he was um, a man of great integrity, I think, and great courage. Uh, and he was loyal, even though he suffered for this. Henry Bostwick was actually born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, but came to Canada in his uh, teenage years after his uh, mother had died. And uh, he was uh, raised in the, in the Port Dover area and set up his, his business in Port Dover, uh, known as Dover Mills at the time. Uh, Henry married a uh, loyalist daughter, uh, Anne Williams, and uh, they uh, raised their family in Port Dover. And, um, he uh, went off to, uh, to be a, learn to be a lawyer, and so he was uh, one of two, two lawyers in the London district before the war started. He was also with the 
the um, Norfolk Militia, so he was a captain with the Norfolk Militia before the war started. Uh, early in the war, Henry was appointed by General Brock directly to be a Lieutenant Colonel of the 1st Oxford Militia. Um, it was uh, very apparent early in the war that, that uh, uh, Brock uh, needed to take an offensive action, and that was done through the attack on Detroit. But Henry Bostwick was asked to take uh, command of the land forces that were going over by land. And Henry and his forces actually got to uh, the Detroit frontier before, before General Brock did. There were a number of battles that Henry was involved with throughout the war. So there is uh, um, uh, Lundy's Lane, he was in, involved there. He was involved in the battle at Fort Erie, uh, one of the battles at Fort Erie. There's a number of them there. And uh, he was most noted for the uh, Battle of, of Nanticoke Creek, where a number of, of traitors were captured. Those traitors were, were uh, taken off for the uh, Bloody Assize trial at, at Ancaster. Um, so Henry was. Uh, chief witness for the prosecution at that particular uh, trial as a, uh, he commanded the forces that captured those traitors. Uh, interestingly enough though, his brother-in-law uh, was, uh, was the defense lawyer and he was the other lawyer in the London district at the, at the time. So it was sort of a family, a family affair. Uh, later on, uh, Henry commanded the last battle on Canadian soil at uh, the Battle of, of Malcolm's Mills at Oakland, Ontario. And so it was, a, it was a very devastating time, but, but Henry um, was written up in a recent article where he, he was a rock when everybody else liquefied. Mary Williams was born of Dutch ancestry in the 13 American colonies. And uh, during the American Revolution, uh, her husband, Jonathan, was a captain on the British side, and then they came to Upper Canada. They were here by 1801 to Norfolk County in what was called then Dover Mills, and it is now Port Dover. He was the uh, customs manager at the port of Turkey Point, and a farmer. They had, he farmed, and that's how they made their living. And. Um, then when the War of 1812 happened, they were all in the militia. Jonathan and the three sons, Titus, John, and Elijah. And the little boys were at home. The girls were married and living out. Well, she had many small children still at home. Um, Francis, Isaac, Henry, Horatio Nelson, and Charles were all under military age. So she would, be, she would be busy with those little boys to begin with, and with the men away fighting, she would be left with the daily chores as the other women in the neighborhood would. So she would be milking the cow and feeding the chickens and doing whatever a farm wife would do with the husband and the, the growing boys all away. It wouldn't have been easy for her. It wouldn't have been easy. When the war broke out, Mary's life changed dramatically. Jonathan had been a captain for the British during the American Revolution. Therefore, he was still called Captain Jonathan Williams. The day in May when the Americans landed at Dover Mills, the mist was heavy over Lake Erie. And when the mist cleared mid-morning, six sailing ships were moored just outside the port, with smaller boats bobbing around them. Over 700 men came ashore and were raiding and pillaging. So when Mary heard that, that morning, she lifted the treads to the loft and put knickknacks, pewter, treasures, papers in there and nailed the treads down for safety. When the enemy banged at the door and said, Mrs. Williams, you have 30 minutes to collect belongings before I set torch to the house. But she said, you're not burning. 
and they said, we have been instructed to burn Captain Williams' home. And with that, he thrust her aside, and he went and set a torch to the mattress, straw mattress. So she took the mirror off the wall and told Isaac, who is now 14, to run and hide in the ravine. She grabbed her cherry sewing stand, and that's all she had time for. And the house burned to the ground. A straw mattress in a wooden house would go in seconds. She didn't have a chance to do anything else. You know. I'm astonished she had these two things and that they have actually survived. You know. After it was over, after the burning that day, then she learned her daughter, Anne Nancy Bostwick, her home, carriage, and all the movable property was burned, and she and her small children were also homeless. Well, if, if I look at my great aunts, who were her, her great granddaughters, I think she was sparkling and fun and uh, capable, uh, a bit bossy, but uh, manageable. <laughs> so uh, she persevered. She was strong and she persevered. Titus Simons was born in Enfield, Connecticut in 1765. He was the son of Titus Simons, who was a United Empire Loyalist. Um, Titus Simons fought with Burgoyne during the American Revolution, and he came to Canada uh, via Montreal, where Titus Simons was a sheriff. He was in Montreal in 1777 and uh, they settled in Flamborough in about 1780. He was a grist mill and lumber mill owner. Um, he was the um, a printer. He had the um, Upper Canada Gazette and American Oracle was his newspaper. He was a king's printer. And he was the first sheriff of Gore in 1816. He was a very, very civic-minded person, very involved in politics and his military career. When it came to the uh, War of 1812, Titus Gere and his brother John Kingsley were members of the Second York Militia. In 1813, he was a senior officer stationed at Burlington Heights, the main supply base and hub of communication. As from the jackets, you can see that he was wounded at the Battle of Lundy's Lane. He had his arm raised to lead his men into attack, and he was shot by friendly fire. And then a, a family tale goes that an Indian runner was sent back to Flamborough to uh, bring Hannah Coon Van Every Simons to his wife to his side, and she had her little baby in her arms and made the long trek on horseback to his side. Contemporaries would probably say that he was a very proud man, a very um, strong conscience, very moral. Um, he has been described as a Puritan. Um, he had a very strong sense of what was right and wrong, and that he was a true friend. I've already documented my lineage from Titus Gear Simons, my third great-grandfather, by using primary documents. And I think this is the ultimate test now to prove that this is my great-grandfather. He, he fought for what he believed, and I think he was a very great man for his time. Uh, my name is Stephen Fred Petro. I'm technical manager of the Lakehead University Paleo DNA Laboratory. We are located at Lakehead University 
in Thunder Bay. Uh, our laboratory specializes in getting DNA from ancient degraded material. We also work on uh, modern samples. Uh, we do uh, ident human identification testing. We can determine uh, species of, of uh, biological material, whether it's animal, human, or plant. Uh, we do paternity testing and any other type of human uh, relationship testing. We provide a sterile cotton swab uh, because we want to use a, a swab that's DNA free. We're going to take that sterile cotton swab and we're going to rub it on the inside of the cheek for about 10 to 15 seconds. And what that is going to do is remove any excess cells inside your mouth that you normally just swallow. And we're going to take those cells that are collected and extract DNA from them. There's two ways of collecting the DNA. One is to actually cut the material that is stained out and send that back to the lab. Or if that is not possible, what we do is try to transfer the stain off of the material onto a, another substrate. So in this case, we used a moistened cotton swab, rubbed that on the area, and we were hoping that um, the rubbing of the swab on the area would uh, trap or uh, transfer any DNA that was on that stain onto the swab. Uh, then you would send the swab back to our laboratory. My name is Roberta Seeley and I'm the conservation technician with the Hamilton Civic Museums and I've been asked to do the DNA swabbing on the Titus gear jacket because I'm trained to handle artifacts and I have a sensitivity to uh, their needs. We want the testing to be as non-destructive as possible to the actual item, so what we will do first is take an interior swab from the coat sleeve. Uh, we are doing this to determine whether the red is color fast or not. We want to make sure that when we're taking the swab, we're actually lifting the blood stain and not the color from the jacket itself. So I'm just uh, taking the interior swab to check for color fastness and I'm just rubbing the swab gently over the interior of the coat. I'm going to do this for the 10 to 15 seconds recommended for the test. Uh, we're not getting any lifting of the dye, so this shouldn't cause any damage to the artifact. Uh, so this is where he was shot um, in the arm and you can see the discoloration in this area so uh, we're going to take a swab from around there. Once we receive the swab at our laboratory, it's taken to a special area of our lab we call a clean lab. We extract the DNA, purify it, uh, isolate it, and then we target the specific mitochondrial DNA in terms of generating a profile. Uh, and hopefully when we compare the profile of the modern reference sample and the profile from the blood stain, you would either have a match or a mismatch. I was uh, in grade six at the Central Public School on Hunter Street, an old school that my grandfather had gone to and so on. And um, uh, it was in a local history class. I had been a rather poor student, indifferent student. And um, I heard this name, Richard Beasley, for the first time about the settler. And that started my interest in history. So uh, I was aware of Richard Beasley, and I, I, but all we 
really knew was that he was a fur trader and wasn't much else. I, I was interested in him and whenever I'd come up to Canada on a vacation or something, I would look in the archives to see what I could find. As a matter of fact, yeah, I came to the knowledge of, of Henry Bostwick rather late in, in my own life. So um, I, I knew that I had relatives in the War of 1812. Uh, I had relatives that founded Port Dover. Um, I knew about the burning of Port Dover because I was raised in Port Dover myself up until I left about, when I was about 20 years old. But, um, but I didn't have any direct, uh, direct family history about, about Henry. And it was actually a distant cousin of mine that, that mentioned uh, Henry to me. So I started doing uh, research and found out all sorts of wonderful things about him. I first learned about Mary's story in 1978. My son Tom, who was with Parks Canada, stationed in Niagara-on-the-Lake, said to me, Mom, we've always been told we have a loyalist ancestor. Why don't you prove it for 1983? Or prove it's a myth and we'll forget it. I said, okay, I'll do that. I thought it'd take me 10 minutes. Well, I got started into it and discovered that in going back in my genealogy, it was through the, the women and the name changed in every generation. I didn't know the name of the man even. So I met with my Aunt Iva, who lived in Norfolk, and we did all the cemeteries to find tombstones that might have given us a connection as to what the, parent, the parentage of each woman. So I finally worked my way back and discovered his name was Jonathan Williams. And since then, by documentation, I have proved my descent in each generation by birth and marriage. My mother got involved with the United Empire Loyalist Association here in Hamilton, and uh, you sort of get drawn into it <laughs> along with her. And, uh, my love of genealogy started there and continues to this day. I really enjoy doing it. I started off with these publications that were in newspapers. You put together the family tree from various resources from the Archives of Ontario, the Upper Canada Land Petitions, and all the, you go through all the births, deaths, marriages, wills. The wills start to give you an idea of what their personality and character was like, how they lived. Um, and you, you just want to start building up these people that, you know, so that they're just not, not dates and you know, places. You want to sort of discover who they were. Um, the connection um, ha uh, of Richard Beasley to me today uh, has made me uh, appreciate uh, the city of Hamilton. As far as I'm concerned, I've always wanted to be a writer and I've written all my life. Um, so I was had this book in the back of my mind for many, many years and uh, I was glad that eventually it all came together and I was able to do it at this late uh, time of my life. I, uh, I'm a resident of Kitchener now, but I was raised in, in, in Port Dover for the first 20 years of my life. I currently work as a Director of Risk Management for uh, Manulife Financial. Um, I also do speaking engagements or, or reenactments as both General Brock or, or Henry Bostwick. I always tell people I, I, uh, I get more requests for Brock because more people know about General Brock, but I, I prefer doing Henry Bostwick. So it's, it's, I, don't, I don't think of myself as special because I've got these connections, but it, it definitely is a, is a fantastic connection and I, and I love playing Henry Bostwick. I have written 11 family history books and I have a degree in history from the University of Waterloo in the independent studies. And I work at it all the time. I go to genealogy fairs, I help people trace their loyalist ancestor, and that's how I met Bob Rennie who is now Brock. <laughs> I grew up in Burlington. I worked for Inniskill and Wines for 10 years in, in Toronto in their office there. And I've also been involved as a library technician, which sort of goes along with doing the research. Uh, 
Uh, I think a great deal of him. I mean, I think he was a courageous fellow. And um, the very fact that even under pressure, he did not go over to the American side, but stayed with the Canadian side and uh, defended the country. I think he deserved credit for that. I'm pretty sure I would not have been a reenactor if I didn't have this connection. Um, and I certainly would have, wouldn't have been a commander. Um, reenacting world has a, a subculture in its, in its own right. And, um, but I figured f for uh, Henry Bostwick in particular, he's my ancestor and I can play him if I, if I want to. It's, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a journey that I have enjoyed. And met wonderful people, learned my history, and still learning my history, you know. And your curiosity just keeps going and you just want to keep developing these people and making them real.